Hi everyone and welcome back to the 10 on 10 series. We've had a similar series in the past where we were discussing 10 questions for 10 days and we're back with the same but this time a little different from the previous one. So we're going to alternate between pathology and microbiology but I've added a little more variety to make it a little more interesting. So the first two days we are going to discuss one-liners of each subject. The next two days we'll have image spotters of each subject. The next two days will be the need of the art that is clinical questions. The next two days is going to be matched the following and this particular way will help us cover a lot more topics. And the last two days we are going to wrap it up with PYQs. So let's start with day one where of pathology I'm going to ask you 10 one-liners and let's get going with the first topic which is to do with genetics and you always get a question on Prader-Willi syndrome and Angelman syndrome. Both of them are to do with chromosome number 15 but the gene is different. For Prader-Willi syndrome it is always the SNORP gene which is going to be a problem over here and for Angelman syndrome it is the ubiquitin that is UBE3A gene which is going to be problematic. So we can see how we've learned it, SNORP gene for Pradavilli and UBE3A gene for Angelman syndrome, both of them on chromosome 15. All that we need to know is what is imprinted and what is deleted. So in Pradavilli there is paternal deletion and maternal imprinting and in Angelman it's the other way around that is maternal deletion and paternal imprinting. The easier way of learning this was Papa's region is deleted so that you will know Pradavilli is always deletion of the father that is the paternal deletion and maternal imprinting and it's the other way around that is maternal deletion for angel man. I hope you also remember that angel man babies are also known as happy puppets because of their inappropriate laughter. Let's move forward to the second set where we have to guess the cardiomyopathy based on of course the image that is given over here and a very important history of a severe emotional stress. Usually they give you a land dispute in the question or they give you a death of a family member and that is to do with Tacot Subo cardiomyopathy which is also known as the broken heart syndrome because excessive emotional stress results in the release of catecholamines and maximum catecholamine receptors are present in the left ventricle. So this left ventricle now balloons and becomes very similar to a tacot subo which is an octopus catching pot and thus the name is very self-explanatory over here. A very much expected question. So we can say this is a type of a dilated cardiomyopathy but in dilated cardiomyopathy all the four chambers of the heart are going to get dilated whereas in tacot subo cardiomyopathy it is only the left ventricle which is going to get dilated. Moving on to the third question, which I think is the most dreaded one. Where are all the depositions happening in different diseases of nephrotic and nephritic syndrome? For that, I hope you remember this is the filtration membrane that we have over here, where you can see the podocytes, which is nothing but the visceral epithelium. The second are going to be the lining of the blood vessel, that is the endothelial cells. In between the two, we have a basement membrane, which of course will carry on everywhere in every part of the body. And in between the glomerulus, the center part is known as the mesangium. So now we need to know which disease deposits where starting off with the sub epithelial sub epithelial means I'm talking about the podocytes or the feet like processes so what will get deposited over here that is below the podocytes are two diseases one is nephrotic and one is nephritic under nephritic we have PSGN which is seen in pediatric population and under nephrotic we have membranous glomerulonephropathy which is seen in elderly people how we had learned this podocyte stands for feet so very small kids are going to touch the feet of elderly people so for small kids it's PSGN GN and for elderly it is MGN. After that, now what else can we see? We can see sub-endothelial means below the endothelial lining of the blood vessels and that is going to be MPGN type 1 and also the via loop lesions that you see characteristically in SLE. Moving on to intramembranous because if MPGN type 1 was sub-endothelial then intramembranous would mean that is in the basement membrane and there is one disease known as MPGN type 2 which is known as the dense deposit disease which deposits in the membrane or the basement membrane. Finally, we are left with what is happening in the mesangium, mesangium or the middle and that is going to be the Berger's nephropathy which is also known as the IgA nephropathy because it is IgA1 that is getting deposited in the mesangium. So these are all the depositions, much more than one-liners, I believe. Moving on to the fourth one, another expected one asked in the recent INI set also. This is a diabetes case. So they will always give you an HGB A1C level, which will be uncontrolled, something like a 9 or a 10%. So diabetic nephropathy and the characteristic lesion is the kimelstein wilson lesion. So of course, we're thinking of diabetes. The other name of this is known as nodular glomerulosclerosis. So you can see how the pink color is present in the form of nodules. And if you want to confirm it, the special stain uses passport. Positivity. 
Moving on to question five is to do with all the genetics that is to do with polyps, another expected question. For juvenile rectal polyp, as the disease happens in children less than five years of age, the name of the gene is also less than five, that is SMAD2 and SMAD4. The next is putes jaggers polyp. How can we forget this female or male, whatever image is given, is usually of a mucocutaneous pigmentation. And jaggers, because the polyp is very commonly seen in jejunum, this is to do with 1111 because the name of the gene is also STK11 and this usually manifests after 11 years of age. The third and the fourth are to do with the same set of genetics, that is cow den is to do with P10 gene. And similarly for benign ruvel rille syndrome, it is also the P10 gene. Finally, coming to the Cronkite Canada syndrome, the polyps related to this have no gene associated with it because this is the only non-hereditary hamartomatous polyp syndrome. So what did I say? Hamartomatous polyp because all of these tend to show you hamartomatous polyps. The only non-hereditary one not related to genetics is Cronkite Canada. Moving on to the sixth one, one is of course the tumor markers starting with the ovarian tumors for the surface epithelial tumors it is going to be ca125 for dysgerminoma in the ovary and seminoma in the testes it is going to be ldh and plap this has come as matched the following earlier and we expect something similar as well for yolk sac tumor of course it is alpha fetoprotein for choriocarcinoma without a doubt it is beta hcg and for granulosa cell tumor it is inhibin and also the cd marker is cd99 positivity granulosa cell tumor has been a recent INI set exam question as well. So very much expected in the upcoming FMG and NEAT PG. Because we're talking about tumor markers, let's continue and finish all the tumor markers. Like I just now told you, CA125 are for surface epithelial tumors, usually the serous ovarian tumors. Similarly, alpha fetoprotein is for yolk sac tumor in the ovary. But apart from that, in the liver, it is to do with HCC and hepatoblastoma. Moving on to CEA, C for C. So this is going to be for colon cancer. CA199, no one forgets, you flip the 9 and you get a P that is pancreatic cancer and CA15-3 from the 3 you get a B so that is the tumor marker for breast cancer something very very important for this exam. Moving on to the eighth one, you have an image given over here, which is of course hematology. They've asked you the supravital stain. What is the name of it? The best one is new methylene blue stain and it is used for staining reticulocytes. I hope you remember the reticulocytes are named so because they are made up of a reticulum of RNA and these blue colored dots that you're seeing are RNA. The normal reticulocyte count is 0.5 to 2%, even up till 2 to 2.5% is acceptable. Moving on to the ninth question is about site of absorption, something very basic but often asked in the exam. For iron, the site of absorption is going to be the duodenum and we know this is very, very important, especially in celiac disease because celiac disease very commonly attacks the duodenum and that is why patient has iron deficiency anemia. Celiac disease is the same one with gluten sensitivity. B12 gets absorbed from the terminal ileum and folic acid gets absorbed from the jejunum. Another question asked is that which infection causes which anemia? So for example, they have given you an infection of hookworm. Hookworm is to do with iron deficiency anemia, whereas if they give you a question to do with diphilobothrium latum, they are usually indicating you towards the B12 deficiency or the megaloblastic anemia. Moving on to another question in the same order is that when you're talking about iron absorption, what is the master regulator of iron metabolism? And I hope you remember I've been always giving you homework. So that happens to be your homework for the day, a single one-liner. What is the master regulator of iron? What is that molecule? And along with that, you will tell me whether it is a positive regulator of iron or whether it is a negative regulator of iron. Moving on to the last question, which we have, and I had to wrap it up with something to do with the cells. You can see a lot of DDD cells written over here, which is a must know. So let's start with degmacytes. Degmacyte is, we've learnt it as dog bite because these are the bite cells and we can see those bite cells over here which are classically seen in G6PD deficiency anemia. The next one is the drapanocytes which are known as the sickle cells, of course seen in sickle cell anemia and without a doubt, without zooming in you can see it. We are expecting a question on sickle cell anemia because of the mutation which is your homework number two for the day. That the mutation that is glutamic acid replaced by valine happens at which position because that has changed and it's an update I've told you multiple times so you will be writing it in the comments. Homework number two. Moving on to the third one is of course dacrocyte. Dacro word only tells you teardrop so they are going to look exactly like a teardrop as you can see the red blood cells over here and they are seen whenever there is an element of fibrosis. So in the bone marrow, if there is fibrosis present, while the red blood cells will exit, the red blood cell shape will change into a teardrop and thus that is called a dacrocyte. So degmacyte is bite cell, so dog bite, drapanocyte is sickle cell and dacro 
of course means teardrop these were the 10 questions of the day and i'll be meeting you with 10 similar one liners tomorrow for microbiology and you know the rest of the schedule that has to follow i hope you will be keeping up with this do remember your two homeworks homework number 1 is asking you about the negative regulator or the regulator or master regulator for iron and i think i've given you one answer over there and homework number 2 is asking you about the position at which the mutation of sickle cell occurs so see you tomorrow in the microbiology series